Uh, Venerable Santistica Bikuni began exploring meditation in the late 70s. In 1996, she joined a Kriya Yoga-based center where she deepened her meditation practice and made spiritual development the central theme of her life. In 2002, she received a Master's of Divinity degree after completing a four-year interfaith seminary program to become a minister. In 1999, Aya Santusika made her first trip to Thailand to visit her son, who had ordained there as a monk in the Ajahn Chah lineage. As a guest of the monastery and the mother of a monk, she was able to spend a lot of time with the monks and learn from many of Ajahn Chah's students. Over the years, she traveled to Thailand once or twice each year to stay in various monasteries, learning from master teachers, including Ajahn Jayasaro, Ajahn Anand, Ajahn Dun, Long Tham Mahabua, and Ajahn Panyabhadra. With the gradual deepening of her faith in the Buddha, Dhamma, and the enlightened Sangha, it became clear to Aya Santusika that she wanted to become a Theravada Buddhist nun. She took Anagarika precepts with Ayatantaloka Bhikkhuni in 2005 and spent a year helping Damadarina Vihara. She then took up training at Amravati and Chitras monasteries in England until 2009, when she moved with three of the Siladhar nuns to San Francisco to start Aloka Vihara. Desiring full ordination, Ayatantusika turned to the Sri Lankan tradition and received the seminary ordination in 2010 and Bhikkhuni ordination in 2012 at Dhamma Vijaya Buddhist Vihara with Aya Sudarshana as her preceptor. In 2012, with the help of Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi and her son, Aya Santusika started Karuna Buddhist Vihara, a neighborhood Theravada monastery for bhikkhunis now located in Mountain View, California. Her teachers are primarily based on the suttas of the Pali Canon as they are applied to everyday life and lead to awakening. A turning point in Karuna Buddhist Vihara's history came in 2014, when Aya Chitananda decided to join the monastery. Since then, they worked together to develop Karuna Buddhist Vihara and share the Dhamma. So Aya, it's a pleasure to have you here with us and thank you so much for, for joining Ajahn Kovilo and I. It's my pleasure, thank you for inviting me. So we wanted to begin with um, asking uh, a few questions. The first of which, You've had the opportunity of visiting some of the most venerated teachers of our age. For example, you may have spent more time speaking with the late Ajahn Panyavado than almost anyone else we know of. What two or three teachings or moments stuck with you the most from your time with him? How did those meetings change your trajectory in life? It's a big question. <laughs> it's a big question. And I think. Of course, uh, many of the things that he said at the time were incredibly helpful and grounding and directive and, you know, helped me, me move in a direction that I felt was really beneficial. I think perhaps being in his presence and experiencing the way he was approaching the Dhamma and life was as much as 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 impactful as actually anything that he said at the time he already had cancer and his reflections on the body and the way that he was at ease with what was happening to the body was really an invaluable lesson and his patience answering so many questions and I think really understanding um, the, the, those around him in a way, you know, to really support them in their development. So every day at the time that he would come to sit out in front of his kuti, or I'm not sure if it was his kuti actually, but there was a spot where he would go and have afternoon tea and then we could come there and it'd be a group of monks a small group of monks maybe five or six and I would come um, and my son was visiting at that time also and my mother was with me and we would go to to sit with Ajahn Panyawada and listen to him and it was all questions and answers and 
I got a chance to really ask him so many things. Some of the things I remember in, in terms of advice for my meditation, he, he told me that when my mind um, is in meditation, that I could let it go out wherever it wanted to go. And that was an interesting kind of change from what I had been um, really, I want to say, trying for. And maybe it was a bit of, of a encouragement to not try, um, which is so important in, in developing samadhi. He also gave me some important pointers about the things I was experiencing, pointing out um, some of the aspects of samadhi. And when I asked him about becoming a nun, because it was the summer before my visit with him that I had already kind of had a nimitta, or maybe you could call it, in my meditation of myself as a nun. and. I really didn't have any idea which form would be the most conducive. So we talked a little bit about the Meichi form and the Siladara form and, and the Bhikkhuni form. And one of the things that he said is, I wouldn't advise pursuing Bhikkhuni ordination because it would require that you, you have to fight for it. qualities that you develop would be the qualities that are counter to what you really want to be developing on the path. And so I, I took that in, but I didn't, I, what I took in was the, the wisdom of what you really want to develop on the path. So by the time I had the opportunity to ordain as a bhikkhuni, it was in a context where I didn't have to fight for it which was important. I could just receive the ordination here in the United States and not have to pursue this as some kind of um, cause. It could just be a natural unfolding and there was support. Um, and so that was, it was helpful because of that, you know, like really paying attention to what are we developing and if the, the goal that we want to pursue requires us to develop qualities that we really that really are not conducive to our development on the path, we should find another way. So he wasn't at all speaking against Bhikkhuni ordination. Only, you know, be careful how you do it. So that was very helpful to me. I'm and I'm sure there, there were many other, <laughs> many other things. Uh, he warned me, even though I felt like I pretty much had overcome sexual desire. He said, don't be too sure. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> that was really helpful. <laughs> well, I'm curious. I, the, um, that's a really meaningful reflection. And one of the things I was struck listening to those interviews, and I think most of the monastics in our tradition have listened to those interviews with Ajahn Panyavado and you and uh, your son, was you can, you know, I don't know if you referenced the Nimitta explicitly, although you might, but there's also other moments where you can see the path becoming more and more clear in, in your mind and your heart. And it was really meaningful for me to watch, to sort of hear that happen through the course of these interviews. And was that something that was catalyzed by your time with him or was it, um, you know, how did that play into meeting, you know, him and other really high level teachers during those years? I'm curious. Yeah. Well, there was, um, a lot of development already started in terms of really taking in not just the teachings of the Thai forest masters, but also connecting, 
connecting with them and and experiencing their support i, I have to say like energetically um, the previous year so i usually would come to thailand if i went once a year in the fall in november or de early december something like that and the previous year i met ajahn tui and I don't remember, I probably told Ajahn Panyawato this story, so you may have heard it. I don't know if it was part of the recordings, but Ajahn Tui, um, the, the way it turned out in a dream that night, I met Ajahn Mahabua without ever knowing anything about him, not even his name. And it was such a powerful dream of Ajahn Mahabua uh, saying, you can get enlightened. You just have to practice relentlessly. You have to really practice. It was like pounding. <laughs> and it was also like his name was flashing in neon, Mahabua, Mahabua. And um, the next morning, there was a knock at the door of the Kuti, and it was my son. And he I thought it was odd that he would come before going on alms round. And he said he had to come to give me a book that I should read. And when I took it and looked, it was by Ajahn Mahabua. And so it was a, a powerful introduction and a message that really took root and was the, the basis for real faith, I think, in the unfolding of the path in those who are awakened, uh, really coming to trust the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. And then I wanted to visit Ajahn Mahabua the next year. When I came, I wanted to go to his monastery and thank him. But he wasn't there. And so I got to spend that time with Ajahn Panyawato, kind of waiting for Ajahn Mahabua to come. And it's such a lovely thing to, to realize that sometimes what we're looking for is not always, um, I can't say not always the most important thing, but that many things can happen along the way that we didn't expect that can be really valuable. And so spending time with Ajahn Panyawato, it was actually weeks before Ajahn Mahabua showed up. My determination was to wait there until he did. And it was so helpful because um, after that dream um, earlier that year, uh, many things happened in my practice during the summer. And like I said, even the, the notion that I would become a nun. And it was, it was really helpful to day by day have the guidance of Ajahn Panyawato to understand more clearly what, it, what my intentions were and how they might un, unfold, how they might come to pass. That was a really powerful reflection. I, uh, I know stories of Long Tama Habua. Um, for those who don't know, he was one of the most esteemed teachers in Thailand known for his fierceness. So um, it's very interesting that the instructions you also received on the path to meet him were to avoid, uh, avoid fighting and avoid conflict, but it makes a lot of sense at the same time. And also during that time of staying there, there were a couple of more dreams of Ajahn Mahabua and it was you know, the one that I remember most is one where he was clarifying about this decision about what form to pick up. And they, it would happen that the monks were having this conversation about whether or not it's okay to have a second meal, have breakfast, and then a midday meal. Or if that's like just kind of like um, really diminishing the quality of the practice. And in this dream, Ajahn Mahapua was showing me three boxes. They were like these plastic containers that, you know, have the lockdown 
handles and in each box was a different set of meals. In the first box, you got one meal. <laughs> in the second box, you got two meals. In the third box, you got three meals. And he said, you can get enlightened doing any of them. And that's not what matters. What matters is what else is in the box. I'm curious what has, so if the, the will, if the intention to sort of fight your way to the destination wasn't in the box, and if certain elements of the form weren't paramount, and sort of that, that whole ethic and language around um, battle or, or, or fighting wasn't what steered you. I'm curious what, what you see that's been in the box for you. What's, what's the language that has guided you and how would you sort of characterize how the Dharma has moved you along this road? Well, first and foremost, it's been faith. I mean, really trusting the Buddha. So the decisions that came along the way of which form to pick up really were, were guided by that faith in the Buddha. So one time after I had been a bhikkhuni for a while, I visited Thailand and I was invited to give a talk at, at um, Ajahn Buddha Dasa's center in Bangkok. And someone asked me why I became a bhikkhuni. And I knew that it wasn't the ordinary question of what brought you to become a nun, you know, it was why did you become a bhikkhuni because it's such a um, controversial thing to do in some circles. And my answer was just because of my faith in the Buddha, that's the form he offered. That's what he created. That's what he felt was most conducive to awakening. And I still think Ajahn Maha, the, whatever the dream, I can't say Ajahn Maha, Buddha did it, but that dream of you can get enlightened in any form, I still believe that. But for myself, I saw that um, this, as I checked in to my faith in the Buddha, I was led to pursue this path. And to really dig in to um, trying to understand the Dhamma as best I can through the suttas and also really listen to these enlightened teachers because they may not say it in the same way as you find in the suttas because they're speaking from their experience. But what a tremendous kind of collection of expressions of awakening and the path to awakening to, to work with. And so that benefit of just happening to be able to be in the presence of different teachers along with, you know, that kind of really deep faith was, was what really guided my development. And I just feel very fortunate in that. And I, I re often recommend that people find um, enlightened teachers that they want to spend time with and learn from them. Um, it's more important, I feel, in my experience, more important than almost anything else you could do with your time or your money. <laughs> I'm, um, I know you spent several years in seminary with getting a, a divinity degree. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So was that, um, you know, you speak about faith and I know for me, there were sparks of it before I really dove into this path, but, uh, your movement through seminary seems to attest to the fact that it was quite something was calling you then too. And I'm curious if 
how your time and what you learned about, say, Christianity or the other traditions, how that, um, what points of resonance you found with this teaching and how it's informed your, your practice, and also what, you know, particular parts of Buddhism have really struck you, um, distinct from those traditions, and yeah, just how, you know, speaking to your experience with faith and religion beforehand, because um, it seems like it was uh, part of your life then as well. Yeah, I mean, I was raised in a fairly fundamentalist Protestant church, and my family went to church all the time. And, um, but I often tell the story that they didn't really agree with everything. So it led to a lot of conversations and discussions. And my grandparents on both sides of the family were in the same kind of situation. So people took religion seriously and they really investigated it and discussed it. And that was so helpful because um, it did help me um, I was interested from, I think, before ever coming into this life, but it was helpful to really absorb and learn. And I had a lot of faith. And as I, but I also had um, some challenges with, uh, as my parents did, with Christianity as it was presented. And then the seminary, I, I spent seven years practicing at this this sense and it was really helpful because the approach wasn't um, like a comparative religions approach it was the approach that focused on the common thread that runs through all the major religions so you got a chance to see how the religions meet particularly with regard to virtue and how they meet particularly with regard to the mystical experience and, and one of the things Ajahn Panyuato talked about when I, when I met him was how he felt that the, the desert fathers really, really had the right idea. And you can see this echoed through mystics in various religions. We're all, after all, working with the same spiritual reality. And even though we come to it from different perspectives and cultures, and ways of expressing it and, and many maybe other overlays of um, cultural conditioning and perhaps even a ton of defilements, you can still find the same goodness. And so one of the beautiful things that came out of that seven years was that I had much more appreciation or I think understanding or a different perspective on my religion of origin that made it possible for me to reinterpret it uh, in, in, the, in the context of more Eastern thought. So instead of so much emphasis on how we're all going to hell, which part of the religious experience was, um, very Calvinistic, so there's a real dark side <laughs> to, to it, and and to really really take in the the beauty and the precision of karma, and to really take in that there's not a fundamental badness, um, a fundamental uh, sinfulness, and yet we do come with these defilements that obscure our um, our understanding and you know so it for me as i was learning about these things in the seminary and practicing a lot there's a lot of practice involved and a lot of practical skills uh, that we were um, asked and helped to develop i also was seeing you know spending those times in thailand and really seeing how the Buddha expressed this and how the Buddha took it much further, it felt like to me. And the, the point of being really challenged with this concept of God, it, you know, moving from a theistic model to a non-theistic model was 
was very important and powerful and and it was personal i can't say that I, someone else should should or would have the same experience but for me as i investigated what i perceived to be god i had to ask myself what am i adding on to the direct experience that's really just ideas labels things have been told rather than what i'm experiencing and what is in it that causes me to want to solidify that energy or being whatever and what i real what i came to was that by having this concept of god and the faith in god i was solidifying the concept of me a personal me that god has a plan for and i talked to ajahn amaro once i said you know the the plan that god has for my life and he said plan there's no plan <laughs> and i said wait a minute first you told me there's no god then you told me there's no soul now you're telling me there's no plan what am i going to hang on to <laughs> of course we laughed <laughs> quite a lot because <laughs> that is the idea isn't it <laughs> and that was what was happening i was really you know solidifying my sense of self so what happens when you strip that away then what is god and you know this was one of the things that um Ajahn Panyawado helped me investigate. And it was it was wonderful to when I do still remember him saying, if you really if a person really investigates God, they'll come to the truth. And so that was really helpful. Thank and you. I have a lot of respect for all of the religions and people who practice seriously. And someone asked me, why did you turn away from Christianity? And I said, well, I haven't really. I mean, it's, it's more like I met up with a group of people who actually practice their religion with incredible sincerity. And I also found that the Buddha expressed the spiritual reality that we all are working with in the clearest way that I could find. I, uh, your explanation of kind of uh, your move from uh, faith, like in a, a Christian context, or what you were studying in a seminary to like faith in, in the Dhamma in, in Buddhism um, is quite interesting. I'm curious also if you might be able to speak to the difference in not just the doctrine, but like the different roles of being a, um, yeah, an interfaith minister versus being a nun. Did that play into your decision to decide not to be a minister and uh, to go the path of going forth as a a Buddhist nun, or was it mostly the doctrine? I, I find this very interesting because, you know, people who are not Buddhist, you know, they see a monk or a nun, they've never seen a monk or a nun before. And they're like, what are you thinking? You know, like there's no future in, in that, you know, be a minister, you know, there's, it's like a, some, it's a known quantity, you know? So mm -hmm. uh, how, what is your relationship with the form or these two forms actually? Well, in my situation, becoming a minister would have been a part of my life as a lay person and the other parts of being a lay person I, I had gotten remarried um, and it was uh, to a very very good man who um, actually a few about a month or so, maybe two months after my time with Ajahn Panyawato and also time with Ajahn Dung that year, um, my husband just announced one day that he didn't want to be married anymore. And that was really shocking and a little hard to absorb, but the Dhamma came up so strong, um, knowing that 
everything changes. And even though um, we think something's going to last, we know it's not going to last forever. I asked myself at one point, why does this hurt so much? And I know that it's, you know, this, this marriage wasn't going to last forever, but I realized that I had expectations that it would last a lot longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, you know, when I talked with Ajahn Panyawado and also with Ajahn Dan about my wish to become a nun someday, it would be after my husband died, after my mother died, and after my unborn grandchildren would be able to drive to come visit me. And I walked away from saying that to Ajahn Dan, and his response was, well, your family situation is such now that it's not really possible, but there might come a time in the future. And when we walked away, my son said, do you know what just happened? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you just expressed an adhijan in front of an araha. This might happen faster than you think. And it sure did. And so coming back to the difference in the roles of ministry and monastic, it's like, this was the way to fully immerse myself not have a job. I mean, I know that there are so many similarities in what you do in ministry, but it's still, you still have that um, kind of personal home life. And the monastic life allows for a deeper integration of how you live, what you do, and serve and the companions that you have, one of the greatest things is living with people who also want to talk about Dhamma all the time. Um, you know, it's hard when someone's married to someone who just wants to talk about Dhamma, and not do anything else. <laughs> and you're not on that page. <laughs> that can be really challenging. Um, and so it's that kind of deep immersion and, and full, full on dedication. And I really appreciate what I saw, like spending time at a Bayagiri or, you know, when you're in the presence of monastics and you're staying in a monastery, you see them in every kind of part of their life. They don't just come out and give a talk and disappear and do whatever. You see how they deal with everything. And I wanted that and I wanted to have that kind of pressure, I guess you could say, to, to, to really live this um, as best I could possibly do. Hmm. And there's, it's just so much more immersed. And that's not to say one couldn't be immersed as a minister. It just wasn't the right way for me. Yeah. And that, yeah. That training was so helpful to give me some experience in, especially in guidance, spiritual guidance and other things that, were, you know, like we had to learn how to teach children and we um, deal with people who are ill or dying and, you know, just all kinds of different practical things. It was really helpful. Right. So I don't mean in any way to minimize the dedication of ministers. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't hear it that way at all, but I really do appreciate um, you used the word pressure to talk about maybe life at a Bayagiri or like any, any monastery, you're kind of like, yeah, there's nowhere to hide really. One other aspect of, of ministry, um, which as I've observed it is, is basically doing a lot of teaching. And that's one thing which, you know, in certain strands of Thai forest Buddhism, I mean, specifically Ajahn Mahabua, you know, he would um, really teach about, you know, the, the pitfalls of teaching or say, you know, you shouldn't, people shouldn't teach until uh, they're an art, you know, arhat or a sotapanna. People shouldn't teach till they're a sotapanna is, is what I've heard him say. Um, so I'm, I'm curious though, I mean, it, it does serve the, the function though of, adding this pressure and really kind of making you solidify your understanding of the teaching. Um, and you do, I mean, you're 
an abbess of a monastery and give teachings on a very regular basis. What role does does teaching play in your in your spiritual life, in your growth in Dhamma? Well, it's very central to my practice, really. And I was kind of a born as a teacher, like even as a child, it, as soon as I would learn something, I would be willing to help my fellow student figure it out or whatever. It was just a natural, like, like I'm willing to repeat myself a thousand times and you know, it's like, it's all those things that are kind of teacher quality. So that's a deep karmic thread for me, I think. And, and for me to really use teaching as a way for, to drive the understanding and the experience of Dhamma deeper is, is very much a part of my practice. And a willingness to put yourself out, out there and be vulnerable and learn as you go. Um, and you get a lot of help from the people who are listening and you know, people who have a lot of knowledge of experience. And it's, um, you know, the most important thing is that we awaken. And we need to find the things that will help us do that. And it's not the same formula for everyone, for sure. For me, teaching is a part of it. And I hope also a benefit to, to others. Yeah, I uh, was very intrigued when you talked about um, Ajahn Panyuado's advice to you that you should just let your mind kind of, you know, let, let the chain go a little bit and not try to restrain it, um, maybe in, in a certain way. And uh, because I think on, you know, other of those recordings, um, uh, or at least on the same CDs, I'm not sure if it was your conversation with him or not, but it's, I think it was actually some young monks talking about, um, Ajahn, you know, how do we stay in robes? We want to, you know, mm -hmm you know, stay long in the robes for, for our whole lives. How do we do that? And his answer very quickly to them was, you've got to get your samadhi together. And um, that's, yeah, I've read other things from Lungta Mahabua. And I'm curious, I've, I've heard other teachers say that kind of, you know, I've quoted that line to them and they say, they kind of laugh and say, you know, good luck. You know, it, it's not everybody who, you know, gets nourishment from um, samadhi right off the bat. And, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, marriage, you know, and how it's it's an unsure thing. I'm, I'm curious if you have any further thoughts about, yeah, finding skillful means to figure out what is just right for the long life of uh, your monastic life or when you're advising others about their monastic life. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say, I don't, I don't think there's a just right, um, but I think that, well, first of all, I'll say I've known, I've known from the time I was in Anagarika that I would never put down the ropes. And what is it that makes that happen? Um, it's samadhi, but it's also panya. It's important to see the reality, you know, as, as Ajahn Panya Wado, but all of the other, Ajahn Blian had a huge impact on me also. Um, he talked about his practice from beginning to our hunship. And that, kind of relentless investigation into the the three characteristics and into the, the nature of the body. And, you know, it's, it's like, there's not a just right, but at every choice point, which is, we have way more choices than we think to really keep going and to really um, want to know. And to want to know the truth, no matter what we have to let go of, no matter how painful it is, no matter how 
disturbing it might be. Because in the end, it's, it's freeing. And I, I, really, I really appreciate teachers like all of these teachers we're talking about because it's not a one size fits all kind of thing. They don't have a formula. They look at the person. And I think that comment from Ajahn Panyawada was the last day when I said, what advice do you have for me? And I don't think it was recorded. Mm. But, you know, it's, it's like, it's like that idea of, you know, guiding someone to more balance, mm. something I, uh, sustainable. Oh, apologies. Uh, I, I've been really moved by basically everything that you've mentioned about faith. I mean, the strength of your faith, what the causes of it are, the various dreams that you've had, and just the strength that's come from that. And I think faith um, in Buddhism or faith at all is something which I think comes very difficult um, and not easily for many Americans. And you as a teacher, I'm curious if you have any uh, ways to teach faith. Is there any way that you've found that you can actually like engender faith in other people by your, by your teachings? Well, I think first of all, I often tell people that my faith was built brick by brick and to realize that it's a process. It's, it's not a goal, not really. It's, it's that you investigate as you go, you really look at what, what's true and compare your experience or investigate the Dhamma in, and your experience in the light of Dhamma so that you can validate the veracity of the Buddha's teaching yourself. And you can also look at other people. This is another thing Ajahn Panyawada said. He said, you can see things in other people. And he was talking about defilements, really, at that time, I think. And he said, immediately, you turn around and you say, do I do that? How do I do that? And I am more likely to, I tell people that, but I'm more likely these days to talk about goodness we have to really take in the good that we have, what we do, um, and never in an egotistical way. If we're really doing it correctly, it's humbling. And to really see the benefits of our life and the beauty of these teachings and the beauty of picking them up and using them and how the mind changes, how our behavior changes. And then you look at some of these teachers that like have been watching Ajahn Pasano for 20 years and I've been watching Ajahn Suchito since maybe 2006. And the, the development that I've seen to become more and more loving, more and more soft and sure, you know, it's just so beautiful. And I, and I saw this in various monks when, when I'd visit um, Wapanana Chat and my son would come to see me. He came almost every day to see me. And he would always bring another monk or two along because he can't see a woman by himself. This was so great because I could really ask a ton of questions and learn. And then you can see like junior monks kind of like, of course, everybody's different, but they got there's some, something, there's a way that's, you know, kind of stage of development. And then you see the ones that are kind of in the middle and how that's kind of different. And then you see the ones who have been at it for 10 years or 20 years. And you just, you know that it works. <laughs> this training works. And when we, when we see that development in other people, then we can say, yes, I can do that. I also can do that. And we need to really encourage ourselves all along the way. Um, reflect on what's good. And also with samadhi, you know, not to have some high ideal, like oh, I got to get four jhanas, but just like 
can I feel the happiness, the joy when I become mindful and still um, and just let that unfold. So that's my approach, at least sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that, that's great. I mean, it sounds like, um, yeah, in terms of inculcating faith, it really, it sounds like is a matter of just encouraging oneself and just seeing that change takes place over time and one might not be able to see it in oneself, but one's monk brother friend's mom sees it in one <laughs> over the years. And maybe after the recording, I'd love to hear names, but uh, <laughs> no pressure. But actually on, on this topic of, um, of faith, I, you had the beautiful quote that my faith was built brick by brick. And it sounds like you have, you've had faith and have studied and gotten a lot of uh, spiritual nourishment from Thai teachers, Thai great Kruba Ajans, and from Western teachers, Ajahn Pasano, Ajahn Suchito. But you've also mentioned that maybe one of your primary teachers is the Pali Canon. And I'm mm -hmm. curious what form that takes. Like, how do you structure your, your Sutta study? Is it a daily thing? Is it a a short thing? Is it a long thing? What's what's it looked like? Well, it's changed over time. In the beginning, it was, let me see where the book falls open and what the Dhamma has to say to me today. <laughs> and it's amazing how well it worked. <laughs> but then I really started to want to know what did the Buddha say um, and and not be confused about the many things that were told that the Buddha said. So that led me to really want to read cover to cover. And so as I would do that, um, I started to, and I put it together more, you know, kind of the, the framework or the coalescing of these different ways that the Buddha would describe the Dhamma. And so it wasn't, um, it wasn't, rigorous in a certain way i'm not a I, i'm not a very like oh you read this many suttas a day kind of person it's more like you read when you it's like you eat when you're hungry and i was just hungry for the dhamma a lot and i i also love talking about the suttas so that being a very strong part of what we do at the monastery and it really feels so important, especially in the context of being in the West and maybe even more particularly in the Bay Area in California, because there are so many different flavors of, of the way people approach uh, the Buddha's teachings and so many things that get mixed in. And if that's helpful to people, I think that's good as long as there's right view, which sometimes that's um, a little tattered. I think, and it's really helpful for us ourselves to know what's in the Pali Canon uh, and what isn't, and how to tell the difference between something that really accords with the Dhamma and something that doesn't. And so it's, it's, um, it's something that I encourage everyone to do, take a real interest in the early texts and even if some of it feels very foreign and weird, um, fortunately, it really was was not did not feel that way to me. Um, even the things like, you know, how human beings started out by wanting to, you know, like eat the sweet honey and then rice, and you get more. I mean, to tell you the truth. Um, I feel like I was shown how we come down to being a human being. It's very much like that. <laughs> so don't think that you can't experience directly what the Buddha talked about. <laughs> don't doubt that. <laughs> Just keep working at it. Just keep open, stay open. I, I've found your answers have been, um, moving on a lot of levels, um, the personal stories and the, you know, interactions with these teachers who I've admired for so long and some of whom I've never had the opportunity to meet. And one thing that really uh, 
got my interest was your reflection on Ajahn Panyavado speaking about uh, God and saying that if one investigates God, then one will come to truth. Because it really does strike me that um, this is just such difficult territory to speak to, but language does approach a singularity at some point where, you know, so many religions do tip their hat towards some place that can't be articulated. And um, obviously I think God is a conception of some, you know, bearded man in the sky wouldn't be considered the ultimate in a Buddhist context. My teacher in Thailand did say that they're, you know, thinking of um, God as emptiness, there, there might be some resonance there. Mm. And certainly, you know, there are these phrases in the suttas like incline one's mind to the deathless. Mm. And I know teachers in our tradition have emphasized the deathless, um, like Longpur Sume uh, Sumedho. So did Ajahn Panyavado speak any more about, about that concept of, of God um, and, or, or anything else around that? It's, it's a difficult realm and dangerous in some ways. I'm just mm -hmm. curious if there are any more words to share on that. Hmm. I don't know. Um, I know as I looked back at the, the titles that were given to some of those sessions, God showed up a couple of times. Maybe we need to re-listen. <laughs> I don't really remember specifics about, about that. But I do think it's true that the mystical experience at some level can't really be articulated. And um, and when I look at the cosmology that the Buddha described, I see all other traditions fitting into it. And I think that the, the main understanding that all realms are impermanent and and involve some degree of suffering and are not self. And this is so crucial to understand. And I do feel like the, the depth of practice in other traditions come to a similar conclusion. And when you really look at what Christian mystics have said and Jewish mystics have said, and I have, I can't say I'm so well versed in all the traditions of what the mystical, how the mystical experience is described, but I, I feel like at least what I've encountered, um, there is that understanding of this not being a personal thing, letting go of this perceived entity. And that instead of that being devastating or confusing, it's freeing. It brings joy. And, and it brings with it the natural flow of generosity and giving to giving in every way. And that's one of the things that was so impressive to me about so many of the teachers that I've met, how loving and selfless they were. And I should, of course, mention Ajahn Gunha because he's more recently been one of the most important figures in my life. And, you know, after so many years, of living from this place of awakening and talking about it, it's become quite simple. You know, maintain your sati, samadhi, and panya constantly and do everything as a gift. 
Thank you, Aya. Um, and you've, I think I speak for Ajin Kovilo and myself both when I say I feel like you've given us quite a gift this evening. And just in terms of the friendship you've extended to us and Clear Mountain, we uh, really look forward to a long and um, caring relationship. So thank you so much for, for everything. And we know you have puja to go to, but are there any final reflections that you would like to share or what are your feelings? Well, I'm so pleased to see the two of you working together and what you're intending to create. Um, I'm happy to cheer you on <laughs> and, um, and to, to remember that these great teachers in our traditions have left us with those who are not with us anymore in the flesh have left us with so much that we can put to use and embody ourselves so that that can be passed on and um, to not take that as some kind of burden but as a joy as a an opportunity to really love people and to really love the Dhamma Thank you so much, Aya. Yeah, it's been a real delight hearing your experience. You've been practicing Dhamma in one way or another since before Tanisabo and I were born. So uh, it's very nice to hear your perspective. And yeah, your faith really does kind of shine, shine through. And uh, yeah, it's, it's contagious. And um, yeah, thank you so much for taking this taking the time and hopefully we'll have more conversations in the future. That would be delightful. All right. Thank you for creating this opportunity.